few weeks we've been looking at the history of Kazakhstan during the Soviet period. Um, as you recall, I hope we are focusing on three overarching themes of Kazakhstani history in the Soviet Union. We are looking at how authority was asserted uh, and for what purposes. We are looking at the limits of state control over society. And we are looking at the costs of the Soviet project of modernization by focusing on the theme of exclusion, social, political exclusion. And today we will, re we will really focus on this last theme of exclusion by examining the history of the Gulag. I'm sure this term is very familiar to you. Some of the largest Gulag camps in the USSR were located here in Kazakhstan. Um, but I want us to think beyond the stereotypes today. I want us to think about um, the functions that the Gulag fulfilled by uh, looking at the Gulag as an institution of isolation, punishment, and terror. That's our third theme for today. By looking at the Gulag as an economic enterprise, we will think about the kinds of economic functions that this, um, this institution fulfilled. And finally, we will think about the importance of the Gulag as an institution of reforging people, of transforming people's beliefs, identities, uh, political attitudes. I will not discuss why certain groups were repressed in the USSR today. This is a theme for another lecture. Uh, we will talk about degulagization. We will talk about the Great Terror of 1937. Um, I will also not discuss the history of Stalinist terror as a whole. You have to remember that a lot of the victims of Stalinist terror never actually came to the Gulag. They were shot in the basements of the NKVD uh, without any fair trial, uh, and they were not sentenced to Gulag sentences. They were simply killed. So just to sum up, our question for today is the following. What functions did the Gulag fulfill in the 1930s? Now, our knowledge of the Gulag is, to a very large extent, based on literary accounts produced in the second half of the 20th century. I'm sure you have heard about Alexander Solzhenitsyn and his Gulag Archipelago, uh, which was published in English in the early 1970s, although, of course, it was originally written in Russian, uh, but it was published uh, outside the USSR in English. This book provided a generation of scholars and students with what has become the classic depiction of Stalin's penal labor system. Solzhenitsyn wrote about the Gulag as a specifically Soviet phenomenon, which means that he understood the Gulag as arising out of the October Revolution of 1917, almost as a, um, as a um, necessary consequence of the Bolshevik Revolution. His gulag was an archipelago, isolated from society at large and located in the most remote parts of the Soviet Union. The people that Solzhenitsyn wrote about were mostly members of the Soviet intelligentsia and the military, even though the gulag contained a much more uh, complex, much wider array of prisoners, Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn focused on these two groups in particular. And Solzhenitsyn focused on a very particular type of a gulag camp, surrounded by barbed wire, uh, with guards, where torture was used on a wide scale. And he also wrote about, about a particular time, about World War II, which by all accounts was the most brutal period in the gulag's existence. Now, useful as this account is to us, we have to remember that the gulag was a much more uh, diverse institution than what Solzhenitsyn conveys to us. Before we discuss what functions the Gulag fulfilled in Soviet society, we have to establish what the Gulag was. And on the most basic level, the Gulag was an administrative acronym. It stood for Glavne Upravlenie Ispravitelna Trudovich Lagiri, or in the English translation, the main administration of corrective labor camps. As an institutional entity, it came into being in 1930. Of course, this doesn't tell you much about the nature of the Gulag, uh, or it doesn't give you any detail about the types of Gulag camps that existed. Now, if you look at the table that you see in front of you right now, you will realize just how large of an institution the Gulag was. 
I do not expect you to remember all these numbers, of course, but I do want you to pay attention to the spikes in the Gulag population, especially after the year 1937, when the number of prisoners grew very quickly. This was, of course, to do with the so-called Great Terror, about which we will speak in another class. The numbers you see here, I should say, are problematic for several reasons. First of all, they do not include all of the Gulag prisoners. Approximately one half of the Gulag population was um, forced to work in so-called special settlements, of which I will speak about more in a few minutes. The population of the special settlements is not included in the figures that you see here. Moreover, the figures that you see do not say anything about death rates in the Gulag. Uh, if we think about all the people who died, uh, the numbers that we would have to uh, reconsider the numbers of people who actually went through the Gulag. Now, it's very difficult to estimate what the death rates were, in fact, but we know that uh, the year 1932, 1933, the year of the Great Famine in large parts of the USSR, uh, was one of the most deadly years in the Gulag. We also know that deaths increased again in 1937 and in 1938. The period of World War II, when supplies to the Gulag were really the last priority of the Soviet leadership, were also extremely difficult and witnessed very high death rates. Now, there were very different types of camps in the Gulag. There were extremely large camps, often devoted to a particular branch of the economy, mining, forestry, construction, or agriculture. The largest camps were often a kind of base camp for a series of what could be called satellite camps, sometimes colonies, branching off from the main camp. Apart from these kinds of large camps, there were also gigantic construction projects. For instance, the White Sea Canal, of which you may have heard. After World War II, there were so-called filtration camps for Soviet prisoners of war who had been imprisoned by the Nazis and who are now returning to the USSR. The Soviet authorities did not trust them, and they put them in these special filtration camps. There were post-war strict regime camps, or Asobri Olagiri, uh, which existed between 1948 and 1954. They were um, created especially for what the Soviet authorities considered to be politically dangerous prisoners. If you've read uh, Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, it takes place in one of these um, strict regime camps. In 1942-1943, um, estimates suggest that there were anywhere from 55 to 65 labor camps, each of which had multiple subdivisions. In addition to this variety of camps, there were also different types of so-called labor colonies, and this is a topic that we know much less about. There were colonies that served as labor offshoots from the main camps, there were colonies that housed minors. There were specialized colonies for disabled people. Estimates for the year 1940 suggest that there were 425 such labor colonies with a population of about 300,000, 320,000 people. In a far from exhaustive list, there were also camps known as Sharashki. These camps exploited the intellectual and scientific knowledge of specialized prisoners, people who had the knowledge of topics which the Soviet leaders were especially keen uh, to keep in secret. Let's say scientists working on nuclear energy. Once again, to return to Solzhenitsyn, uh, the first circle is set in a sharashka. Given the secrecy of the projects which people worked on in these settings, very little information has emerged for their specialized study. Apart from these camps and labor colonies, there were the special settlements that I mentioned before, the population of which was not included in the table that I showed you. 
There were as many as 2,000 of such special settlements by the end of the 1930s, and they formed an entirely different world within the Gulag. These settlements, as I said before, accounted for roughly half of the forced labor population. Um, generally, they were smaller than the Gulag camps. They were remote little places on the map of the USSR with populations consisting of entire families. So not just individual prisoners, but their wives or husbands and children. These families were forced to move to these special settlements from various parts of the USSR, where they had to build their own homes, plant crops where it was possible for self-sufficiency, and work in nearby industries, which were always, in the Soviet Union, in need of labor. Now, in the beginning of the 1930s, most of the people who lived in, most of the people who lived in these special settlements were the so-called kulaks, the rich peasants or the peasants whom the Soviet authorities deemed to be rich and potentially disloyal to the USSR, uh, who were deported to special settlements during the collectivization campaign. We are talking about close to two million people settled in these special settlements. In the second half of the 1930s, the dynamics changed. The Soviet authorities uh, were becoming increasingly suspicious of ethnic minorities, especially those ethnic minorities who had um, so-called external homelands. So, for example, there were, there were many Germans living in the USSR. Uh, the Soviet authorities suspected, suspected them of cultivating links with Germany or of potentially siding with Germany in the case of uh, a seemingly impending war, and therefore they deported them from the western parts of the USSR to the special settlements further east. The same thing happened to Poles or Koreans. All in all, no two camps were the same. The sector of the economy very much defined the lives of the prisoners in a particular camp, labor colony, or special settlement. So if you, worked, uh, if you worked in mining, your life would be quite different from a gulag prisoner who worked in agriculture. Individual gulag bosses, the guys in charge of individual camps, uh, could exert a very important imprint on the lives of the prisoners. And the geographic location of a camp could determine such life and death issues as food and medical supplies, the quality and the quantity of camp personnel, and relations with Moscow. What about Karlag specifically? In today's lecture, we will focus on Karlag, one of the largest um, Gulag camps in the whole of the USSR, located on the territory of uh, modern-day Kazakhstan. Now, the history of the Karlag begins in 1930. At that time, it was an offshoot, a branch of another camp called Kazlag, uh, or Kazitlag, uh, with headquarters in Almaty. Kazlag was established in 1930, but it was disbanded within a year. And Karlag turned into a camp in its own right. It was a very large camp. It's Core territory spread some 300 kilometers from north to south and some 200 kilometers from east to west. It also encompassed independent divisions around Akhmolinsk, uh, so modern day Astana, and uh, around Balkhash. Karlag was devoted primarily to agriculture. The vast expanses of the camp really affected the lives of the prisoners. In front of you, you see a citation from um, the memoirs written by one of the prisoners who received a three-year sentence in the Karlag during the 1930s. She said, we forgot that we were prisoners, that before us was a long term. This was all the particularity of, of Grand Karlag. It is very big. Its territory is huge. Its territory is huge. In the middle of Karlag is the convoy zone, strict regime. Everyone is under strict supervision and convoy. But the rest of the prisoners, those under the general regime, live without convoy. You see in this citation the variety of gulag experiences 
because the Cadillac was an agricultural camp, it was spread over a very wide territory to facilitate farming. Some prisoners did not encounter guards on a day-to-day -day basis. Some prisoners never really saw a barbed wire fence that would prevent them from running away. They still found it very difficult to run away, although some tried and some succeeded, although very few, um, because they were housed in uh, very remote locations, because they could not obtain documents that would allow them to obtain tra train tickets or to um, get a prapiska in another part of the USSR. They were effectively stuck there, but they did not experience the presence of the camp administration on a day-to-day -day basis. In contrast, other prisoners that this citation mentions lived in what I imagine most of you picture when you think of the, of the word camp, surrounded by barbed wire, surrounded by guards, subject to a very strict regime. Apart from Karlag, uh, Kazakhstan was also home to the Stieplag, uh, centered in Jeskazgan. Now, uh, Stieplag was a um, special regime camp established after the war, um, and it had extremely harsh conditions. It was even more isolated than the Karlag. It had stricter controls over everyday life of prisoners, and the nature of the work that they fulfilled was uh, very harsh and very bad for their health. They mostly engaged in copper mining. And death rates were high because of psilosis, a disease caused by breathing in copper dust. So what functions did the Gulag fulfill? The Gulag was, of course, an institution of punishment and isolation. The people that the Soviet regime considered necessary to punish and isolate were different people over in different periods of time. As I mentioned before, the Kulaks were by far the largest group uh, among the Gulag prisoners in the beginning of the 1930s. In the mid-1930s, uh, a new wave of so-called social undesirables, um, hooligans, alcoholics uh, from major cities in, in the Soviet Union, such as Leningrad and Moscow, arrived around the year 1934-1935. In the late 1930s and during the early 1940s, the Gulag population included many members of ethnic minorities. The vast majority of Gulag inhabitants were men, mostly between the ages of 25 and 40. Of course, apart from these prisoners, the Gulag also had a very large administrative staff of about 300,000. In many prisoners' memoirs, the administrative staff, the guards, emerge as the agents of punishment. And these citations that I'm about to show you really show how brutal the Gulag was and how, um, how it served to, to, to punish uh, the population who lived there. The first citation from uh, the memoirs written by a former Gulag prisoner, Petrov, showed how little respect the prisoners had for, for the guards. Petrov really tries very hard to distance himself from the guards um, and to ridicule them. He says um, about those people who ended up working as guards in his camp, those who volunteered for this service were usually men not well adapted to normal working life because they were not too bright, lacked professional skills, or preferred an easy life. As guards in our camps, they really did have a pretty easy time of it. They were not bothered with drill. Their duty hours were usually short, on average not more than four or five per day, and they were excellently fed. They had little to complain about. Petrov here is not only drawing a contrast between uh, well-fed, uh, relaxed, but also incompetent, maybe stupid guards and the starving, uh, suffering prison population, he's also suggesting that the guards um, have quite a lot of freedom in what they do on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. They are not really subject to very strict top-down controls. And this level of um, 
let's say, independence, for the lack of a better word, allowed many guards to approach the prisoners with extreme brutality. Here's another citation which demonstrates the kind of torture that took place in the Gulag. It comes from the memoirs of a prisoner who tried to uh, explain, uh, excuse me, who tried to um, uh, escape from, from the camp but was caught by one of the guards. And this is the conversation that he remembers. I think we need to teach this prisoner a lesson so no one else tries to escape. Let's bloody him up and parade him in front of the prisoners. You don't need to kill him, just make it so he'll never want to fuck again. You fucking slime, a, be a belt buckle smashed across my stomach. Give me the belt, I'll castrate him for life. Smash his balls, beat his face to a pulp. The buckle smashed across my ribs and abdomen again and again. Of course, the memoirs published by prisoners who wanted to um, emphasize, recall, um, gain recognition of their suffering, tend to emphasize the um, most brutal aspects of their life, the most traumatic aspects that were imprinted in their memory. Nevertheless, this citation is very revealing because it shows how brutality and torture was applied almost spontaneously. This was not part of a uh, well-ordered system. It wasn't part of a well-oiled machine. The guards really had quite a lot of um, room to show their own initiative, however macabre this sounds. The Gulag served to punish and isolate people of very diverse social and political backgrounds. There were, of course, political prisoners, many of whom had been committed communists, many of whom um, had themselves participated in earlier terror campaigns in the USSR, uh, who now found themselves in the Gulag accused of disloyalty to Stalin and his vision of communism. Some of them found this a uh, traumatic experience which transformed their ideological views. Uh, others believed that they were an exception, that Communism was still the right ideology, that the Soviet Union was still the most progressive country in the world, but somebody had made a mistake in their particular case. In front of you, you see an account of a conversation between two Gulag prisoners, as remembered by one of them many years later, which shows diverse responses of the political prisoners to the fact that they were now um, considered enemies of the Soviet state. What on earth are you here for? I asked. I am the victim of Trotskyite slander, she declared, sticking out her chest virtuously. But you just wait. I'll pay them back for it, the scoundrels. Oh, so you're innocent like everyone else here, I said. I don't know about that, she replied. I only know my own case and that of one or two of my friends. You must remember that I come from a family in which there are nine Stahanovites, and in my factory I was known as the non-party Bolshevik. But Katya, I continued, you've talked with the others here just as I have. Haven't you got the impression that they're really all innocent, that they really haven't done anything against the Soviet government? She looked at me with fanatical hatred in her eyes. She didn't want them to be innocent. They haven't arrested half enough yet, she spat. We must protect ourselves from the traitors. Both parties to, the, to this conversation recognized that being a traitor to the Soviet homeland would be something that um, you should go to the Gulag for. One of them, the author of this source, claims at least to have begun to question the logic of Stalinist terror. Her conversation partner, if we are to trust this account, is very reluctant to question her beliefs. She still speaks in the Stalinist language. She talks about the Trotskyite danger, the Trotskyite slander, accepting that those people who, in fact, were supporters of Trotsky really are the enemies of the USSR. Her faith in Bolshevism, in the party, in Stalin, does not seem to have been shaken. Other prisoners had a different perspective. 
in recalling their gulag experiences, they spoke not so much about their interactions with other political prisoners, but rather about their interactions with non-political criminals, who also formed a very substantial part of the population of the Gulag. Petrov, for example, remembers two sharply different groups of non-political criminals. The smaller group consisted of well-seasoned bandits and murderers, largely with a death sentence commuted to 10 years in a concentration camp. On the whole, they were quite decent fellows who realized their own worth, feared no person or thing, were able to crack anybody's head without a moment's hesitation, and knew how to make others respect them. The other non-political group, made up of petty crooks and pickpockets, was a constant source of trouble. These creatures in the image of man sang prison songs incessantly. Most of their songs were utterly obscene, and their perpetual swearing was done with variations of the most elaborate kind. One had to be constantly on the alert in order not to have something stolen by them. They stole from the devils, the name applied mostly to peasants sentenced for counter-revolution. These devils, who included all helpless prisoners, mainly of the political category, had a miserable time of it. Downtrodden and frightened to death, they did not have the courage to offer resistance to the socially elect dregs of society. I think this is a very rich citation. Uh, have a look at it and think about what it reveals about the Gulag as an institution of punishment and isolation. It shows us that the punishment comes not only from the Gulag administration, from the Gulag camps. Your life is made miserable by some of the other prisoners. It shows that the Gulag is not only an institution of isolating political prisoners, something that Solzhenitsyn's accounts of life in the Gulag often focus on. The Gulag also includes a very large criminal population. This criminal population consists of both very serious criminals, murderers, uh, as well as petty thieves, hooligans, um, and other, other types of criminals. Finally, and very importantly, the mention of the peasants is um, crucial. It's not at all surprising that authors remembering their, the, remembering their time in the Gulag talk about their interactions with peasants. And this is because the majority of the Gulag prisoners were, in fact, of the peasant stock. Uh, they had been engaged in agriculture before they were prisoners in the Gulag, and many of them continued to engage in agriculture once they arrived there. <clears throat> so others adapted to work in the industry. The historian Lynn Viola has in fact described the Gulag as the Gulag of peasantries. One last thing I'd like to say here is that the boundaries between the prisoners and the guards were sometimes fluid in the sense that uh, guards who worked for the Gulag administration could become victims of the Stalinist terror themselves. They could turn into prisoners overnight. Uh, conversely, prisoners released from the Gulag were often not allowed to return to where they had lived before their prison sentences. Uh, they were effectively forced to live in the vicinity of their site of imprisonment, and some of them found work uh, in the Gulag administration. I would like you to take a few moments to note down the ways in which the Gulag served to punish and isolate segments of the Soviet population. Think about who was there, think about what the nature of the punishment was, and think about the sources of suffering among the Gulag prisoners. The Gulag can also be conceived as a massive economic enterprise. For example, the Karlag was primarily, although not exclusively, an agricultural camp established to transform the semi-desert of the steppe into a productive agricultural base for the provision of livestock and crops to the region's growing population, engaged in the extraction of natural resources, such as coal. The agricultural task before Karlag was daunting. The camp was asked to develop a desert that exceeded in size many European countries, 
apart from engaging in agricultural work itself, prisoners built massive irrigation works, um, damming up regional ri- rivers, um, and they turned the center of the Karlag, the village of Dolinka, into a small city with electric stations, radio stations, repair shops, and the like. They also constructed the roads and the railroads. The special settlers, uh, less so the prisoners of the actual labor camps and labor colonies, also engaged in the mining work itself. So in that sense, they were not only engaged, the the Cadillac population was not only engaged in agriculture, but also in natural resource extraction. The debate about whether the Gulag's economy was actually effective uh, has been a very long one. One of the most important conclusions of the best recent scholarship on the Gulag has been putting to rest once and for all the illusion that forced labor was free or even cheap. As the editors of Historia Stalinskava Gulaga conclude in their study of the Gulag, uh, this institution was a drain on the economic resources of the country. And this is because the productivity of the Gulag labor was low and a matter of constant concern to Gulag authorities. Forced labor was ineffective, almost exclusively physical and unqualified. And the Soviet authorities knew this. Even in the late 1920s and the early 1930s, They recognized that penal institutions were failing in the mission to be self-supporting. In short, people who were forced to work um, and do work that did not in any way correspond to what they were qualified to do were not efficient workers. And this problem was all the more pressing because the Soviet economy was always suffering from a shortage of labor. As literally millions of people went through the gulag, they could not be employed in other branches of the Soviet economy that employed free labor, uh, exacerbating the, pro- the problem of labor shortages um, and exacerbating the problem of labor productivity. Eventually, it became routine for industry bosses to request penal labor, gulag labor, in the same way that they would request any other resource in the uh, central planning process. The fact that the Gulag was not economically efficient does not mean that it was not envisaged as an important part of the Soviet economy. The Soviet leadership may well have believed that the institution was fixable, that it would become more efficient, and that's why they continued to grow the Gulag. Also very importantly, Gulag camps were located in parts of the USSR that were very remote and where free labor was difficult to attract. If you look at the map in front of you, you will see that the vast majority of Gulag camps were located in East Siberia, in Central Asia, in the European north of the USSR and in the Ural Mountains. These were all remote areas with vital natural resources necessary for Stalin's vast industrialization effort. On the eve of the Great Terror in 1937, the Politburo of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union ordered the Forestry Commissariat to transfer entire land tracts and forests to Gulag for the organization of new work camps. This is one example of how resources in remote parts of the USSR, such as woods, were exploited by forced labor. Interestingly, the historian Lynn Viola shows that the geography of the Gulag was not too different from the geography, from the geography of uh, forced exile settlements, forced labor camps, in the Tsarist period. Now, the scale of uh, forced labor, the scale of imprisonment before 1917 was much, much lower than in the USSR. But it is interesting that both the Tsar and Stalin thought it important to bring forced labor to the same locations, which were, on the one hand, remote and often unattractive places to live, 
and on the other hand had very rich natural resources that the state was interested in exploiting. All in all, the Gulag was an economic giant. By the end of the 1930s, it administered a vast economic empire which accounted for up to 15% of capital investment nationally. The Gulag dominated the production of gold, diamond, nickel and tin. The historian Alek Levniuk and several others have documented very well the economic inefficiencies and wastefulness of the Gulag. Nevertheless, during the Stalinist era, Soviet leaders continued to look at the Gulag as an important part of the economy. And it's very interesting that as soon as Stalin dies, already in 1953, Beria, the secret police chief under Stalin, the guy who is effectively in charge of the Gulag, decides that it is time to not completely get rid of it, but to radically downscale the Gulag. The Prisoners are released en masse in 1953, in 1954. And the reason for this is that Beria is aware that the Gulag is not economically viable and it's costing the Soviet Union more than it actually produces. I would like you to take a few moments now to take notes on the following question. What economic functions was the Gulag supposed to fulfill? What economic functions was the Gulag supposed to fulfill? The Gulag was portrayed in Soviet public culture as an institution of reforging. Remember, we've spoken about this idea of the new Soviet person, new Soviet man, new Soviet woman. In Soviet literature, in Soviet newspapers, the Gulag was portrayed as an institution that would help to turn enemies of the USSR into new Soviet people. The writer Maxim Gorky, with whom you might be familiar, famously celebrated the Gulag as an institution that would help to create a new kind of society striving towards a bright communist future. Now it's very easy to dismiss this kind of rhetoric as mere propaganda. And in fact, in many cases, it was just propaganda. Gulag bosses were supposed to build libraries for the prisoners, they were supposed to organize schooling about the building of communism, they were supposed to print newspapers, uh, but oftentimes they were reluctant to commit resources to these kinds of activities. And this is not in the least surprising, given that resources were in short supply anyway. Cultural educational activities required the provision of such frequently scarce items as paper, ink, and actually prison laborers themselves, which the Gulag prisoners preferred to send out into the field or into the mine. Nevertheless, the Gulag administration continued to insist that education should play a role in the activities of Gulag prisoners, even in internal correspondence, which was not intended for public consumption. For example, in 1931, the chief of the Gulag, Gulag uh, wrote to Kazitlag administration about the cultural, educational and political work of the camps. You see the citation in front of you right now. These tasks, he noted, have two goals. To achieve full class stratification of the prisoners and with the help of the strata socially close to us to carry out the necessary measures and to correct and politically educate the socially close element. Not all prisoners were considered to be um, worthy of education. Not all prisoners were considered to be um, capable of turning into the new Soviet person, which is interesting in its own right. He only talks about the socially close elements here. Nevertheless, it is interesting that this kind of insistence on education is present in uh, internal correspondence among Gulag officials. Educational and cultural work in the Gulag, um, excuse me, in the Karlag specifically, was especially difficult given the vastness of the camp. But despite their recurrent um, protests, Karlag's authorities were never released from their duty to complete these crucial educational cultural tasks. For example, they continued to publish a newspaper from 1932 
Um, it was called Putyovka. By the late 1930s, it reached a circulation of 6,500 copies. The newspaper, the camp newspaper produced in the Karlag, uh, was also displayed on the walls for prisoners to see uh, as they walked past. The tasks of the paper over that period were defined as the cultivation of the new man, reforging of his consciousness, familiarizing with labor the hundreds of delinquents who had never known what labor meant and who had lost the proper path in life. The Karlag organized drama circles. The Karlag organized music circles. And what is most interesting is that political prisoners found it most difficult to participate in such activities. They were considered to be beyond salvation a lot of the time. The common criminals were more integrated into these kinds of cultural activities. Cultural work in the Gulag was partly oriented towards improving labor productivity. Issues of the Karlag newspaper Putyovka were filled with articles about labor heroism amongst the prisoners, shock workers, and with articles about the Stahanovite movement. Um, these articles frequently represented the close tie between prisoner attitudes and production. The idea they expressed was that if you uh, work hard and you show a positive attitude towards uh, Soviet's um, effort to build a new type of economy and a new type of society, you would be transformed into the new Soviet person who could be released um, out of the Gulag. The release was promised, it was sometimes granted, for meeting and exceeding production norms. The exact opposite was also true. Prisoners were often sentenced to additional camp terms or even execution for consistent failure to complete work norms. So the idea that Gulag newspapers, uh, official publications in the USSR about the Gulag promoted was that labor in the camps would not just be a means of economic production, it would also be an attempt to reforge the prisoners, to change their attitudes and beliefs. There was a very brutal side to um, this attempt to reforge through labor, supposedly. Namely, the lower your productivity was, the less food you received. So rations were closely tied to productivity. Of course, the less food you received, the weaker you were and the more difficult you found it to actually work in the harsh conditions of the Gulag, be it down the mine, be it in the field, be it cutting trees. So your productivity fell even, fell even further and you received less and less food. In theory, the reduced rations were supposed to break down the prisoners' resistance to proper work. They were, supposed, they were supposed to compel them to improve their labor performance. And in this way, so the so official publications went, lead to their re-education. In practice, this led to many prisoners' demise. One photograph of the International Memorial Society's collection reveals a great deal. In the photograph, we see a propaganda graveyard created by one camp's cultural educational apparatus. This pretend gravesite, marked the graves of the lazy, shows the presumed fates of prisoners Mavlanov, Gaziev and Pazarienny. Each, um, each prisoner's grave is marked with his name and the percentage. Mavlanov, 22%. Gaziev, 30%. And Pazarienny, 48%. So they... 100% would mean that they fulfilled their production norms. These guys did not even fulfill half of their production norms, and therefore they died. It's kind of a um, sobering image. It shows that even on the level of propaganda, death was sometimes celebrated as um, punishment for the failure to transform into the new Soviet person. The 
narrative of reforging, the idea of the gulag as an institution which was supposed to reshape people, is of course very problematic. In practice, the gulag authorities did not trust even those prisoners that they released, suggesting that they did not think of them as reforged into the new Soviet person. Why else would they forbid people from reintegrating into mainstream society? Why else would they forbid them from going back to their homes? Why else would they be forced to live near their former sites of imprisonment? I want to leave you with a question uh, about the relative importance of the cultural educational mission of the Gulag. Take a few minutes to note down your thoughts about just how important the Gulag was as an institution of reforging. On the one hand, we have many accounts of the Gulag administration publishing newspapers, celebrating perhaps real, perhaps fake stories of Gulag prisoners being uh, released uh, into society as the new Soviet people. Um, we have examples of prisoners' accounts, including Solzhenitsyn, talking about just how much they tried to educate them politically, that every morning they stood there and listened to news about the Soviet Union, to news about the great political and economic developments happening in Moscow, uh, suggesting that the Gulag administrators uh, were trying to shape the way in which the prisoners were thinking. On the other hand, we also have accounts like the one that you see right now in front of you, which testify to the informal practices, illegal exchange of goods between prisoners, and shows just how far removed the everyday existence of the prisoners was, uh, the, the everyday existence of the prisoners was from the idealized propaganda narratives of the Gulag as an institution of reforging. As my work partner and I grew weaker, we fulfilled less and less of our norm and received less and less to eat. One afternoon, the brigade leader Kovalov took me aside and said, let me have your boots, then I'll put you back on full rations. I'll also give you an extra pika ration, or even two. My boots were my only treasure, but the sucking in my intestines nearly drove me to eat boiled shoe leather or the bark from a tree. And in the evening, I gave Koval of my boots. Rationing, as I just said, was supposed to be part of the uh, system of re-educating the prisoners, but here we see how that system can be subverted. That's why I would like you to take a few minutes to answer the following question. Just how important was the Gulag as an institution of reforging prisoners? <laughs>